Hey guys, it's Tacho here, and today we're gonna do something a little bit different. So, I know we got the trailer for Bramimon the other day, and apparently a lot of people in the fan base and the Fire Emblem community just have no idea who he is, or either they forgot who he was, or they genuinely never played Fire Emblem 7 and they started with Awakening and so on. So I think that's a little bit criminal, and today we're just going to take a trip down memory lane, and I am going to rank all of the Fire Emblem games on a tier list. And I, I know you guys super enjoy the tier list videos, so we're going to go ahead and do that. We also have a section at the very bottom for games that I've never played, which there's really not too many, but there are a couple on here. So we're going to put them down there just to be fair, and just to not put them in a low tier when... For all I know, they could be an awesome game. So, let's just get started here. We're gonna start things off with Fire Emblem 1. I'm gonna put that in the B tier. So, this is an NES game. The title is Shadow Dragon and the Sword of Light. And it's actually a pretty cool game. It is, of course, the first of its kind, and it preceded all of these, so we have to give it credit for being the granddaddy of Fire Emblem games. And also, I feel like this game owes a little bit to Advance Wars too, because Advance Wars at the time was called Famicom Wars, and the map design in this game is a little bit similar. I know for a fact Bean Island, which was a map in Advance Wars, does make an appearance in one of the chapters in this game. So it's just intelligent systems really owing their IPs a lot and mixing them together in some cases. So pretty cool stuff. The main takeaway out of this game is that Marth does not wear pants, and he's just running around fighting pantsless. So, pantsless Marth is a meme, and he's pretty cool. Also, the growth rates in this game are really janky. Like, I know Joggin, he's got like 0% growth in every stat except HP. And the same with Bantu as well, he's got like 10 HP as his growth, and then 0 in everything else. So, this game, it's a little bit wonky, but... It is fun, and it's pretty interesting to play as a trip down memory lane. So, I will give it B tier as a ranking. Okay, then we've got Fire Emblem Gaiden. So, I've never played this one, and I gotta admit, Fire Emblem Gaiden is by far the most obscure game in the entire franchise. What do I even say about Gaiden? Like, before they made Shadows of Valencia, or Echoes if you want to call it that, this game was so obscure, so random. Even the title, I mean, Gaiden in Japanese, that means like side story or side arc. So it's like, even the title alone is already downplaying it. Cause Fire Emblem 1 is the first of its kind and then 3 is a direct sequel to 1. And then we just have Gaiden in the middle where it's like a completely different story. It's not even that long, I believe it's only like 10 chapters. So it's a little bit awkward. But I've, I have never played the game, so if you have played Gaiden, then let me know in the comments section if you think it's a good game or not. Of course, I mean, the artwork in this game is pretty wonky as well. We got Alm in the front there with his bowl-cut hairstyle, and Celica looking like an 80s rock star. So, yeah, I mean, Gaiden's pretty cool, but it, it is a little obscure, and I have never played it. Okay, next up, we've got Fire Emblem 3, New Mystery of the Emblem. We're gonna go ahead and put that in the B tier as well, alongside the first game. It is a sequel to one, and this time around, you're playing with Marth, and the main enemy is Harden in this game, being controlled, of course, by the Dark Dragon, Medeus. And Harden, you get him in the first game, he's wearing a turban, and he's like, he's on a horse and stuff like that. But he turns evil towards, like, the end of the events in this one and he becomes controlled by the villain, like we see in Fire Emblem Heroes where he's on a fallen banner. So, Fire Emblem 3, it's pretty cool. Some of the tougher chapters at, towards the end, like the ones where there's a lot of flying units and a lot of Pegasus and Wyverns coming at you at once, it's pretty tough. But it is a good game and it's fun, so it's in the B tier. Okay, Fire Emblem 4. This one, this is one that we really have to talk about. Okay, so Genealogy of the Holy War, aka Seisen no Keifu. Sigurd is my favorite lord in the whole series besides Ike. Sigurd is just awesome, and in this game, they make it a point to let you know how awesome Sigurd is. He's pretty much the best character in the entire game, but at the halfway point, <laughs> certain 
nefarious things happen and Sigurd gets wrecked. So then we have to play as Salif for the other half. Salif is not quite as awesome as Sigurd, but he's still pretty cool and we do get all the other child units. So contrary to probably mainstream belief that Awakening was the first game with child units, no, that's actually not true. It was Fire Emblem 4 that started the trend of marrying and having child units. And things were a little different in this one. You could pass down, instead of skills and growth rates, you pass down your holy blood. So Ira, for example, she's from Isaac, and she can pass down her holy blood to Shannon and Lakche, or Larce, I guess as she's called now. So this game was real interesting, and to be honest, the only bad thing that I have to say about Fire Emblem 4 is the fact that the maps are just a little bit too long for my taste. It's just like, the, the maps take up like the whole screen, and there's a lot of forest tiles and a lot of obstacles. And unless you're a horse unit, for the most part, it just takes forever to traverse the map completely. So that is the one downside that I have to say about Fire Emblem 4. Otherwise, the story is phenomenal. The gameplay is really fun. Sigurd is awesome. And it has a fan translation, and it's a pretty decent one. So if you're one of the recent Fire Emblem newcomers, you could check this one out. And I would recommend trying this out at least once. Okay, then we come to Fire Emblem 5. <laughs> We're putting that in the C tier. I hate this game. This is the most imbalanced out of all the games. It's the most unfun in my opinion. And it's pretty much in the same boat as Gaiden where it's just a spin-off to Fire Emblem 4. Leaf and all of these guys are featured in Fire Emblem 4, but this is a side story, side arc kind of thing. And the maps in this game are either super difficult or super easy. Like, the, the enemies are so tough, or you can cheese it with the warp staff and just jump all the way to the end and clear the map in one turn. So, they really weren't thinking too clearly in terms of balance with this one, but... I will give this game credit for the graphics. The cities and the structures in this game, and all of the map design, it just... It was so good that they copied it to a T in the next games that we're about to talk about, the Game Boy Advance ones. So I do have to give this game credit for that. Fantastic graphics for the Super Nintendo, of course. And now we're gonna move on to the Game Boy Advance games, and all of them are gonna be in the A tier for me. So my personal favorite out of the Game Boy Advance trilogy is actually Roy's game. And Fire Emblem Binding Blade, or Sword of Seals, as it was known to me for years. This is the pinnacle of Fire Emblem gameplay and balance. I feel like this is the most balanced game. The first couple of chapters especially, like, you can have sword units attacking these axe units, these brigands, and they're gonna have like a 40 hit chance on you, doing 10 damage a pop. It's like, it's pretty tough, especially in those early chapters when your HP is not even 20 yet. And you really have to make use of the forest tiles to do good in this one. And the thrones in this game as well, like, the thrones are ridiculous. They heal 3 HP at the start of each turn to the foes that are on the throne. And they give, like, 30 evasion. It's just insane. But it is very fun. Also, the supports in this game are pretty busted. Like, Rutger and Clarine supported have, like, a 100% crit chance. Like, 90 evade. It just gets nuts. But it is very fun, and it is a sequel, actually, to Fire Emblem 7. So, they went in a Star Wars direction here, where the sequel came after the prequel. But man, what is there to say about Fire Emblem 7? It's the starting point for most of the people that have played this franchise, and... I played Fire Emblem 7 by complete accident. I know a lot of people found out about Fire Emblem from Smash Brothers. But in my case, I was just over at my cousin's house, and he happened to have the game. And he just asked me to play it, he let me borrow it, and I took it home. And I loved it, like, it was love at first sight for me. The dialogue was like Middle English, they actually spoke like they were in medieval times. They went that extra mile with the translation team with that. So that is the extra bit of effort that I would love to see in the future games as well, but... Nowadays, they just talk real modern-like, and it's it doesn't have the same flavor that it had in all three of the Game Boy Advance games, pretty much. And of course, Fire Emblem 7 is the classic. 
very balanced gameplay. Hector Hard Mode is one of the best difficulty settings. It's very fair, but it's also pretty tough. And I think that's the nicest balance you can have. Just like with Fire Emblem 6, it's a very balanced and difficult game. And last up, we have Sacred Stones. Funny story about Sacred Stones. I actually cut school to go buy this game the day it came out. <laughs> Way back when, in like 2006, I think it was. So, Fire Emblem Sacred Stones. I will admit that when I first played it, I felt a little bit gypped. Because the game is only 20 chapters by comparison to 7. Which is 30 chapters. But I do remember I loved the characters, absolutely. I loved the story, and I did for a very long time have it ranked a little higher than 7 just for those reasons. Larachelle, you put Larachelle in any support conversation, and you have yourself comedy gold. Larachelle, to this day, is still one of the best written Fire Emblem characters in the whole series, and I just love her. I, I wish there was some more Larachelle. I wish Fire Emblem Heroes would actually write her in the same way that they wrote her in Sacred Stones. She's just so funny, man. She's, she's a riot. And also, Tana was my first Fire Emblem waifu, so <laughs> shoutouts to that, I guess. But the real takeaway from the Game Boy Advance Fire Emblem games is that these are the pinnacle, pretty much. This is where the series reached its peak, and even compared to all the other Game Boy Advance games, where obviously the Game Boy Advance was just a clinic when it comes to good sprite work and sprite animations, I feel like even with all that taken into account, the Fire Emblem trilogy on Game Boy Advance just stand head and shoulders above the rest. The attack animations, the critical hit animations, the sprite work in this game is out of control, man. It's just so good. It's it's bliss. It's heaven, man. Just If you started playing from Awakening and onwards, then I recommend highly at least trying 7 and 8, and if you really want to go the extra mile, then there is a good fan translation of Binding Blade. I think it's called Sword of Seals, but whatever the translation is called, it's a pretty good one, so check it out for sure. Okay, now, <laughs> you all knew this was coming. We reached the Tellius games, and oh my god, I just have to say, Fire Emblem Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn are my two favorite games ever made. Counting every other game that I've played, including Castlevania, including Pokemon, including everything else. These are my two favorite games ever made. And it's pretty much a part one and part two kind of thing, so you can't really talk about one without talking about the other. We very much have to keep them together, and they are in S tier for me. Th this is just the absolute best. It's storytelling at its finest, especially in Radiant Dawn, where... I feel like the gameplay just takes a backseat for the most part, and it's just all about the story. The story is so well told. It may not be the best story, like in your opinion you may think another game has a better story. That's all fine and dandy, but the way they tell the story in these two is what really sets it apart. The cutscenes in Radiant Dawn are so awesome, so badass, and in Path of Radiance 2 there's some really great cutscenes. It is very much a shonen type of anime deal here where Ike is like the protagonist and he loses his dad and then he has to get stronger and beat the big bad guy who is the Black Knight. So it's very shonen inspired as far as that's concerned. But it's still like such a great story. It's better than most shonen anime, honestly, in terms of the storytelling and the writing. And the characters, oh my god, it's just like a flood of nothing but great characters. We got Ike, we got, of course, Lethe, we got Mia, we got Volk, who's still not in Heroes, and I really want Volk to be in Heroes. Har was amazing in Radiant Dawn. We have also Jill, who is awesome in Path of Radiance, and she's not in Fire Emblem Heroes either. So, we really just need some more love from these two games in terms of characters, because it's just so many. There's just too many to count. They're all awesome. I love them all. And I think I've gushed enough about the Tellius games for now. One more thing I want to add though is that Radiant Dawn, in my opinion, has the best soundtrack as well out of all the Fire Emblem games. So once again, another nod to Radiant Dawn. And I know a lot of people like to criticize Radiant Dawn for being a bad story or having very watered down gameplay where there's barely any support conversations. They really messed up the supports in this game, I will admit to that. 
But even with all of its flaws, I still have Radiant Dawn as my favorite game of all time, followed very closely by Path of Radiance. Okay, and then we come to Shadow Dragon. How dare they? How dare they follow up Radiant Dawn with Shadow Dragon? Like, this game was such a step back from the series. It's almost a direct one-to-one -one replica of the original NES game. Of course, they do make some changes, but it's just completely reverting back. Like, all, the, all these years, all of these advances to the gameplay that we have made, like support conversations, we had child units in this one, we had an amazing story in this one, and they just completely said no to all that, let's just make a Marth game and have it be almost the exact same game. And this game, they throw so many characters at you, like NPC characters too, like you'll, you'll end up starting a chapter and out of nowhere you'll just find in your barracks some axe guy who has absolutely no name, he's just axe fighter and he's got like perfect stats, it's, it's just really weird. I do not like this game at all. One good thing I will say about it though is the music is awesome, it does have very good music. But I'm really just not a fan. And it's just way too watered down compared to all these other great games that they've made all these nice advancements in. So it is a step back and I have to put it in the C tier. Alright, so next up we have the remake of Fire Emblem 3. I haven't played this one. There is a, actually a really good fan translation of this one, but I may have to check it out at some point. But from what I've heard, this one is way better than Shadow Dragon, and I really hope that's the case, because you all know how much I hate Shadow Dragon. But the really cool thing about this game is that it's also the game that introduces the Avatar character. So we get Chris in this one, as opposed to getting Robin or Corrin in these other ones. So this game does deserve some due credit for that. And I have also heard that the difficulty in this game is outrageously high. Like, the hard settings in this game are numbered, so you have, like, hard 1, hard 2, and then it goes all the way up to hard 5. And I've heard horror stories about hard 5 in this game, so pretty cool stuff. If you have played this one, let me know in the comments section down below, because I really don't know too much about it. Other than, of course, the obvious stuff, like the Avatar character and such. And now we come to Fire Emblem Awakening, which I am also going to put in the A tier. This game was like a breath of fresh air. It had been years and years since we played a true Fire Emblem game. Like, these two, I mean, as good as they are, or as good as you may want to call them, they were just remakes of 1 and 3. So Fire Emblem Awakening was the very first original story in Fire Emblem that we had since Radiant Dawn. And Radiant Dawn came out when? Like 2008, I think? I want to say 2008, but I'm not 100% sure if I remember that right. God damn, this game is 12 years old now? Oh man, I just dated myself with that. But anyways, so Fire Emblem Awakening was a breath of fresh air, and I very much adore all of the DLC maps, because it's just, it's a love story for all the people that played the franchise since the beginning, and all the people that have love for these characters. This game was the swan song for that. They just incorporated absolutely everything they ever wanted to. Child units, they had supports, they had new features like pair-ups and all of that. Awakening was just a home run. They hit it right out of the ballpark. Very great game. And I love it so much. And it's always going to be remembered as the game that saved the franchise. Because, of course, Fire Emblem was about to go bankrupt. And they were going to stop making the games if this one didn't do well. But timing was very key to the success of this game, I think. The 3DS was in a very, very serious game drought when this game came out. So I feel like that alone was enough to push sales and allow people to finally give Fire Emblem a try. And what's also nice for newcomers in this one is that they took out the permadeaths. Or, well, they didn't really take it out, but you have the option to turn it off. So for casual people just starting out with Fire Emblem, Having the ability to take off the permanent deaths was a very big change and and probably gave them a more fun experience overall. So very nice, very good game. And then we come to Fates. Okay, so I know there's a lot to talk about with Fire Emblem Fates, but I have not played it. <laughs> I actually did buy the special edition 
The single cart that has all three versions of the game, it's got Birthright, it's got Conquest, and it has Revelations. I still have that thing completely unopened, and at this point, I'm probably just never going to open it because it's worth a lot of money now. But I did buy the special edition. Someday I'm going to have to play these games, but from what I've heard, it's like a little contrived. The story is a little all over the place, and a lot of people have said just having one main story being focused on the entire time would have benefited more than having three separate stories. And I can kind of see that. Also, a very interesting thing about this game is that the person who wrote the story for this also wrote the story for an anime called Detective Academy Q, which I'm sure most people have never even heard of. It's not really as famous as other detective animes like Detective Conan or Kindaichi or something like that. But I mean, I really can't comment personally because I've never played any of the Fates games, so I'm going to leave it up to you guys in the comment section. Let me know if Fates is great or not. And also, you know, for all three of these games, where would you rank them on the tier list? Please let me know if you've played them because I just have no idea. Alright, so our next game is going to be Shadows of Valencia, Fire Emblem Echoes. I'm also going to put this in the A tier. This is a really cool game. And I really enjoy the way that the dungeon crawling thing works. That's a new feature that they put in here. So when you enter a dungeon, you can fight mobs and it's like, it's, I, I want to compare it to SMT almost, where you go through the dungeon and you see the enemy on the overworld and you can initiate an attack on them with the attack button. So Alm, if he's the one that's moving your party around, he can swing his sword. And he can attack a mob that's that you find in a dungeon and you initiate combat with them. It's a pretty cool way to make the dungeons interactable. The story, of course, is very cool. I love Celica. I love Alm. Very great characters. And there's really not much else to say. Echoes is a great game. Very solid entry to the series. Okay. And <laughs> now we come to Fire Emblem Heroes. Where do we put this bad boy? Do we go with the B tier? Do we go with the C tier? I'm absolutely never going to put it in the A tier alongside all of these fantastic quality games, of course, because this is a gacha game and it's always going to be a watered down version of the real thing. So I, I think C is still a little bit unfair because as much as I hate the gacha aspect and the money grabbing aspect, of course, Thrakia and Shadow Dragon, I just don't like for even more reasons. So I think I'm going to put Heroes in the B tier. I think that's fair. I do love this game a lot. It's one of my favorite gacha games right now. And of course, I wouldn't have an entire YouTube channel based on it if I didn't like it at least a little bit, right? So Fire Emblem Heroes, we're going to put that in the B tier. It is still very fun. It is watered down, of course, from all of these great games. But it does get the concepts right where they count. And I feel like it is still a fun game if you can get around the fact that it's very money focused and you need to pay to win in a lot of aspects. But other than that, it's a great game. And last but not least, we have three houses where I got to be honest, I kind of want to put it in the S tier along with these two. But for I mean, maybe if I had an A plus tier, I would probably have three houses in there. But this game is just so well written. The voice acting is another big deal, like, for the first time in the entire series, we have voice acting in a Fire Emblem game, and I think we very much owe that to Fire Emblem Heroes raking in millions and millions of dollars for them, that they finally had the budget to actually hire voice actors for a full game. And that's pretty much how I feel about Three Houses. It is a love letter to Heroes getting so much money, so they wanted to go all out and they wanted to really show the fans that they care and they appreciate all the money that we've spent on heroes for them. So that is great stuff. I chose the Black Eagle's Path with Edelgard and I chose Crimson Flower. So I've only seen one side of the story. I haven't had time to play the other three paths, but I do very much enjoy this game and it's so satisfying to play. Personally, when I played the Black Eagle route with Edelgard, it was so satisfying to the end to just have such a completely different twist and turn of events that you're playing the game in a unique way that we really haven't seen in any of these other ones. If you want to break Fire Emblem's story down to like a, a formula, I guess you could say, it's always the exact same thing. 
Mad King starts a war. Prince gets a bunch of friends together and they go on an army crusade. Prince loses his parents along the way and then all at the end they fight a big bad dragon. So, I mean, that, that's the type of thing that most of these games, not all of them, but most of them pretty much follow the same path. But Fire Emblem Three Houses is a bit different and I also have to give them a lot of credit for introducing all the new aspects like the school and teaching the students and recruiting them by giving them gifts and stuff like that. It's just a really cool concept and the way that they managed to get it right on the first try with all these new aspects, I gotta give them a pat on the back for that. Hats off to them for really nailing the Garrig Mach Monastery thing on the first try. It is really fun just walking around and exploring the school and talking to all the characters. So they definitely got that right and Three Houses totally deserves to be in the A tier, maybe even a tier higher than A, but I still, in my heart, I wouldn't put it in the S tier along with these two. I just love these two way too much. So that's gonna wrap us up for today, guys. I know that went on for a bit, but we had a lot of fun talking about all these classic Fire Emblem games. So let me know in the comments section down below what your tier list is for Fire Emblem games all the ones you've played and maybe even the ones you haven't played. So all that good stuff, I'm looking forward to seeing your opinion in the comments. So as always, this is your boy Tacho signing out. Hope you guys enjoyed my Fire Emblem Games tier list, and I'll catch you guys again in the next one.